Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Kishwani. We are here because we want to improve our math skill. Today is our lesson number 181 in the series of basic math. Today we'll begin the topic of probability. And as all the other topics they have covered that we have covered so far from day number 1 through 180, you, you already know by now that we are only going to cover the very basic concepts. We are going to cover the typical type of questions, typical type of probability questions that you are likely to encounter on the ACT or SATs or GMAT or GRE. Nothing else, nothing more, nothing less. So let's get going. Today is our first lesson, as I said, in a series of 10, 10, 10 videos. The very first one. We are told that the person A, person A and B, two people are working on, on a problem and, and they are working, we are, we are told that they are working independently. Now we'll talk about that in a second, what that means. We are told that the odds are 30% that A will succeed and the odds are 70% that B will succeed. You can look at that problem in any which way that you want. Typically they talk about uh, hitting a target, they will say that A had a 30% chance of hitting a target and a B has a 70% chance of hitting a target or they're still working on a, on a problem they're working on their own on two separate rooms they have nothing to do with each other A is working on the problem in one room B is working on the exact same problem in the other room they're working independently they do not influence each other the question simply is if I assign two people to work on a given pr problem and they're both working at the same time what are the odds that they will both succeed well we know that they're working independently what does it mean when the two events are independent Two events, two events are said to be independent. Excuse me. Excuse me. Two events are said to be independent if the odds, if the odds of one event either happening or not happening, has absolutely no bearing on the likelihood of the on the likelihood of the other. How successful person B is going to be has absolutely nothing to do with whether or not A will succeed and vice versa because they are working independently. If that is the case, if that's the case, if we know for a fact that two events are independent, which, which they are here because we are told they are working independently, if that's the case then if, if, I don't know what happened to it, if events, if events A and B are independent, then in that case, but they're asking us what are the odds that they will both succeed, and this is how we write it. It's very important that we understand the notation. We really understand. We are very important that we understand language. This is how it's written: the odds, which is same as saying probability, probability that both both A and B will occur. Now I don't want you to get confused. Because here I'm using A and B. It's slightly confusing because of my lousy notation here. Here I'm using both. I'm using A and B, both to denote the events. I'm calling them events A and events B, and they also happen to be the name of the people. So event A is the event where A will succeed. Person A will succeed, and event B is the event where even a person B will succeed. It's not a big deal. So if two events A and B are independent, then this is how we write it: probability, the probability the odds that both A and B will occur. Now what, what I'm trying to make you understand is that this is this is how it's written out but typically we do not write it out like this every single time it takes too long. So in the most textbook in the most textbook in the most textbook with statistics and even on the exam this is how you will see it. A and B. That's it. They will leave out the word both. It's understood that it's both because of the word because of the fact that it says A and B both A and B will occur. The odds of both A and B occurring provided that they are independent provided that they are independent is simply the odds of A happening times the odds of B happening. That's what it is. That's, all, that's how simple it is. One more time this, this, this relationship will only hold if they are independent. We have to make sure that the events are labeled as independent. Here they are. If I'm shooting at a target and you're shooting at the target, whether or not you hit the target has nothing to do with whether, whether or not I'm going to hit the target and vice versa. If I'm working on the problem in one room and you're working on the problem in a same problem in a different room, we have nothing to do with each other. How likely are, whether or not I will be a solve, succeed in solving the problem 
has absolutely no, no bearing at all on whether or not you will succeed in solving the problem and vice versa. These two events are independent and since they are independent the likelihood of both of them happening is the product of the two events. The rest is very simple. The rest is very simple. We are told, we are told that A has a 30% chance. A has a 30% chance. So 30% you can write it as 3 over 10 times we are told that B has a 70% chance. As I said, rest, rest is very simple. 70% chance that's 7 over 10. Keep it very simple. Now we have 3 times 7 which is 21 over 100 which is same as 21% or if you like 0.21. How, how, however the problem, however the answers are presented to you in the exam, that's what you will pick. Answer is going to be either in the form of fraction 21 over 100 or it may be in the form of percentage 21% or it may be in the form of decimal, 0.21. It's the exact same thing. Let's do one more. Let's do one more and keep in mind that we are dealing with a scenario where the two events are independent. Okay? Here's the next problem. So we are done with this one. We are, all, we are done with all of this thing. I'm going to give you five seconds to have unexpected view so that I can have my drink and then we'll do the next problem. Let's do one more. These are very basic very simple scenarios that you encounter in the exam as I said. In the exams, in the test, ACT, SAT, GRE, GMAT, you're not going to encounter any complicated problem, probability problems. Very simple, very straightforward problems. And that's what we're going to do in the, in the 10 videos. We're going to cover all the bases. I'm going to erase all of, this, all of this thing now. We already understand what that means. Let's do one more problem. This time, on the Typical problem that you encounter on the on, on the test is where they talk about either tossing a coin or rolling a dice. Let's talk about tossing a coin. So this time you're going to toss a coin. Well, if you toss a coin, whether you get a head or a tail on the first toss has absolutely no bearing on the odds of getting a head or a tail in the next toss or the toss after that or the toss after that. Each of the toss that each time you each time you toss a coin, these events are independent. These events are independent because the coin has no memory. The coin is not going to say, well, I was ahead last time, I better be tail this time. No. Each time the odds of getting either a head or a tail is just 50%. So let's find out what are the odds of getting two heads in a row. We're going to toss a coin. Toss a coin. And the odds of getting two heads in a row, two heads in a row, by the way, is the same exact odds as getting two tails in a row. No different. The odds of getting two heads in a row or two tails in a row is same, or which is also same as the odds of getting either a head on the first try and a tail on the second try or the tail on the first try and the head on the second try. All of these are all equal to each other because in each case every time you toss a coin the odds are 50% of getting either a head or a tail. The odds of getting either a head or a tail on the second, second toss is also 50%. Therefore, it doesn't matter which combination you're looking at, the odds are one quarter one quarter or 25 percent. There's a 25 percent chance that you will get either two heads in a row or two tails in a row or head on the first first toss and a tail on the second toss or vice versa. Let's do one more. How about how about the odds if the question asks you what are the odds what are the odds what are the odds of getting Ten. What are the odds of getting ten heads in a row? And of course, we understand that the odds of getting a ten heads in a row is the exact same odds as getting the two ten tails in a row. Makes no difference. The odds of getting a head or a tail on the first try is one half. The odds of getting a head or a tail in the second try is one half odds of getting a head or a tail on the third try is one half and so on and so forth it goes on up to ten times and that's the odds of getting all heads all all ten heads or odds of getting all ten tails and that boils down to that simply boils down to one half to the tenth very slim chance as you can see it's a very small amount I'm going to raise all of this thing. We need the room. Let's do one more problem, shall we? Let's do one more problem. And this time, we're going to, instead of, instead of tossing a coin, we'll roll a dice. Instead of tossing a coin, 
let's roll a dial, uh, dice, shall we? Let's roll a dial. Just give me one second here. I'm deciding whether or not I want to digress. But allow me to digress just for a second. And of course, digress means exactly what it says. To digress, of course, we understand. To digress, of course, we, we understand. It means to change topic. Uh, and we learned this word in our vocabulary lesson long time ago on day number one. If you're interested in improving your vocabulary, it doesn't matter which exam you're preparing for, just type in the name of the test, just type in GRE vocabulary words day three or GMAT vocabulary words day three, watch the video, learn the word digress. Allow me to digress for a second. We're going to talk about something which has absolutely nothing to do with, any, uh, nothing to do with probability at all. I want you to understand this, this, this quantity right here. In the language of computer, in the language of computer, in the language, in the binary language, this quantity has a very significant, uh, uh, very large significance. This quantity has, has a very significant place in, in the, in the, in the computer, in the language of computers. This is what is known as a one kilobyte. One kilobyte. Now what does it work out to be? If you were to do it out, this does what kilobyte, contrary to what most people think, kilo of course means thousand, but in the language of computer, a kilobyte is this quantity, which works out to be 1024. A half a kilobyte, a half a kilobyte, or can we put it, a half a kilobyte would simply be one half raised to nine. And a quarter of a kilobyte, a kil quarter of a kilobyte would simply be one half raised to eight. So this is going to be, if this is 1024, this quantity is 512. So let's finish up our work here. One raised to two, one, 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 one half raised to ten, one half raised to ten, even though technically speaking, okay, technically speaking is 1024, which is why I wanted to bring that to your attention, even though strictly speaking this quantity here, one half raised to ten, well, 2 raised to 10 rather, 2 raised to 10 is, technically speaking, strictly speaking, is 1024. Here, let's approximate it, let's approximate it as 1000. We're going to pretend, we're going to pretend that 1 raised to, we're going to pretend that 2, one, two raised to 10 is approximately 1000. So this is, this is 1 over 1000. 1 over 1000, 1 over 100, 1 over 100, of course, we know is 1%. So 1 over 1,000 is 0.1 percent, 0.1 percent. The chance is that you will get all heads in a row or all tails in a row or any specific sequence that you tell me. If you tell me that I want to get a head in the first, first toss and a tail on the next nine toss or I want to get a head and a tail and a head and a tail, whatever combination that you specify, the odds of getting that particular combination is only a tenth of a percent, not even one percent one-tenth of one percent. In other words, there is a 99.9% .9 chance that it ain't going to happen. Do you understand? Let's do one, pro one more problem. Let's do one more problem. What are the odds that if we were to toss a coin, what are we asked? I'm not going to write everything down. We're going to toss a coin right here. We're going to toss a coin and we're going to toss it ten times. What are the odds of getting, what, or let's do it right here as a matter of fact. What are the odds of getting We're going to toss a coin ten times. What are the odds of getting getting at least one head? What are the odds of getting at least one head? Well, the odds of getting at least one head if you toss a coin ten times is equal to is equal to one, which is one hundred percent. One minus the odds of getting no at least one head. Uh, the odds of getting all tails. Odds of getting all tails. The odds of getting all tails we just saw it, it is simply so it's one one minus this this odds that we just saw is simply one half raised to ten. So it's one minus one half raised to 10. 1 minus 1 half raised to 10 and if you work it out it tells you that there's a 99.9% .9 chance 
is virtually guaranteed. It is virtually guaranteed that if you to if you were to toss a coin ten times, it's virtually guaranteed that you will get either a head or a tail at least one time. Because the odds of getting all tails, if you toss a coin ten times in a row, the, the probability, the likelihood that you keep tossing it ten times and every single time it appears tail, is only 0.1%. It's one half raised to ten. And since the odds of ha this happening is only 0.1%, therefore odds of this not happening is simply one minus this, this event. And as long as it's one minus that event, it means you're getting at least one tail. It's not, it doesn't say exactly one, it doesn't say exactly one tail, it says uh, exactly one head, it says at least one head. The odds of getting at least one head is just one minus this amount, which is this quantity right here. Let's roll a, rest, rest, let's roll a dice now, okay? Let's roll a dice. It's getting to be too long, so we're going to wrap it up here. Roll our dice. And again, when we are rolling a dice, these are independent event because when you roll a dice, whatever comes up on the dice in the first roll has absolutely nothing at all, and has absolutely nothing to do with what's going to appear on the next, next roll and the roll after that. Each roll of the dice is an independent event. That's how we say it. Here's the question. What are the odds that we're going to get three on both rolls? We're going to roll a dice twice. What are the odds that we get a three on both rows. Well, that is same as, because these are two independent events, this is going to equal to the probability of getting a three on the first row times the probability of getting three on the second row. When you roll a dice, probability of getting any probability of getting any particular number, doesn't have to be three, probability of getting any particular number, again it's this, the, this event, the odds of this event times this event because they are independent. The events here are independent, which is why it's times. The odds of getting any particular number on a given roll is just one-sixth, because there are six possibilities. So it's one-sixth times one-sixth, it is one out of 36 chance. One out of 36 chance. And this, by the way, that we just calculated, is the probability of getting any particular combination. Let's call it M and N. M is one number and N is another number. Not that it makes any difference, but, but convention dictates, the logic dictates that I put down M and N because typically one writes the variable in alphabetical order. So M is one number, any number between one and six. N is another number, any number between one and six. If you, if you want to pick any combination at all, the odds of getting this combination is simply the odds of getting any particular number on one roll times the odds of getting any particular number on the other roll and that is simply, we just found out, is one-sixth times one-sixth which is simply one over thirty-six where, where m is either less than or equal to or more than n and of course they, they are between one and six. I'm not going to write all of this. Of course they have to be between one and six because that's what you get on a on dice. They can both be equal to each other. So if somebody asks you, what are the, right here, what are the odds of getting three on both rows? Well, the odds of getting three on both rows is one out of 36. What are the odds of getting six on both rows? Well, that's the same exact thing. Odds of getting a six on both rows is still one out of six, one out of six. What are the odds of getting one on both rows? It's the exact same thing. So M and N can be equal to each other. One can be less than the other. One can be more than the other. It makes no difference. The odds of getting any particular combination of numbers on two rolls on a dice is simply 1 out of 36 with the exact same concept as tossing a coin where odds of getting either a head or a tail or a tail or a head or two heads or two tails is simply one half times one half which is one quarter same exact concept here instead of one half times one half we have one six times one six that's all tomorrow we'll talk about the next concept when the time comes where we'll talk about two events being what is known as mutually exclusive and it is, if it is something uh, that you are weak on, it is something that you are not sure about, make sure you watch the next video. Today we talked about two events being independent. Tomorrow we'll talk about two events being mutually exclusive. And after we have covered that concept, then for the, for in the next eight videos we'll simply solve the problems. Do you understand? Bye now.